start the recording. And so I want, are we okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to welcome everyone to today's program. We, uh, I'm Maria Markowitz from the George Cancer Center and Dr. Patton and I will be uh, facilitating this session. We're changing the format around today. So um, instead of having case presentations, we're going to do a um, mole scope refresher. And so I want to abbreviate the beginning part of, um, of our session and uh, so we have more time towards the end. So I'm not gonna welcome as many people. Um, I welcome all of you, but in particular, um, I want to uh, mention our uh, healthcare providers from the Teladerm Clinic. So Wave, as I mentioned your name, we have Dr. Sam Whaling from Lee Medical Arts, Lori Hutchins from Mount Vernon, Maisha McFarland from Soperton, Sabrina Watkins from Evans Health and Wellness, Stephanie Cothern and Carolyn Jones from Baxley, Floyd Soriano and Phyllis Solomon from Metter, Billy Stott from Sylvania, and John Ferrier from Wadley. And welcome to all of our other folks and our Teladerm staff here in, in the hub. So please remember to put in the chat your name, your affiliation, your email address, um, and I think we already have some of those put into the chat. And so I will start with going over today's agenda very briefly. Uh, next slide. So we start with our introductions. Uh, I want to take a few minutes to review the resources that we have for you on our website. And then we'll have our didactic on melanoma dermoscopic patterns by Dr. Buchanan. And then we will uh, do a best practices session, a Moleskope refresher, and um, which will be uh, with Sam, Dr. Sam Whaling uh, and Jody Rye and Aaron Hirsch from MetaOptima. And I hope that the you clinic folks have your uh, Moleskopes by and iPhones by your side so you can practice a little. And then we'll have a, a wrap up and uh, final announcements. Uh, now I'm going to turn the session over to Dr. Doug Patton, uh, who is our um, from our Southwest Georgia uh, campus for the medical college. So take it away, Doug. Thanks. Thanks, Rhea. Um, again, this is Doug Patton. I'm campus dean for the MCG Southwest Regional Campus. And in keeping with the theme of moving quickly through our normal introductions today, I'm going to kind of blow through this um, And because you've all seen these before. Uh, first of all, thanks, everyone, for joining. We've got a great crowd this afternoon, and I hope this is going to be one of those sessions which walk away with some real practical um, applications um, in addition to the normal learning. Um, so this is to help just address uh, dermatologic disparities faced by people living in rural areas by assisting those who are providing care in these rural areas around the state of Georgia. Next slide. There we go. Um, there will be some information later on about CME and CNE on the final slide. Um, we'll also put that information in the chat so you'll have access to it. You can always uh, use the chat for problems, or uh, you can email Kenza, Kenza Mamuni at K Mamuni at, let's see, one more slide up. Nope, there we go, at Augusta.edu, K Mamuni. Um, and if you have any questions at the end, you can email us. Again, questions at any time throughout the presentation can be entered into the chat. And we'll be monitoring that. Next slide, please. So uh, with that, um, we're going to uh, go ahead and uh, let Dr. Buchanan embark okay. on the... No, I'm going. You, you're going next? Okay, I'm sorry. 
Okay. So um, I just want to uh, on our wonderful teledermatology website. Um, I certainly hope that all of you have looked at it, but if you haven't, I just want to uh, focus on some of the highlights. So, um, and I did put the link to the website in uh, into the chat, the very first uh, the very first entry into the chat. So here's our overview page. And if, uh, Brenda, if you can just quickly scroll down. Well, no, uh, no, go. the first page has just an, sort of an overview. It has the clinics and, and has our contact information. Keep scrolling. Um, the, here we are, uh, contact information for members of the team. So then the second, uh, the next section is for healthcare providers. And so we have an overview of the program. We have information about the CME, but keep going down. We have, keep going, keep going. We have of training videos for you. And these are a series of presentations uh, narrated by our one and only Dr. Rabinovitz. And these are available for you to look at at any time that you want. Many of these topics we're covering in our teleecho sessions, but these are uh, longer, more, more detailed. And you can watch these videos in two different ways. You can, um, if you would like to get CME or CNE credit for watching these videos, which range from maybe 30 minutes to an hour, um, you would enter it by clicking on the dark blue box that says take CME CNA course. And when you click there, it goes to the CME page. And um, it, I think it asks a few questions first, then you watch the video and then there's a brief um, three or four question test at the end and you get CME credit. If you don't want to uh, get CME credit, if you don't need to, you can just click on watch video and the, the video, the PowerPoint um, narrated will start. So these are um, a wealth of information for you that you can access just at, at any time. And let's see. Uh, then there's the section on Project ECHO and uh, you can see at the bottom of this section, we have now, this is tele-echo sessions. Uh, one through eight. It's still a work in progress. The pictures aren't, um, the, the title pictures aren't quite right, but all of uh, these are all of the recordings of our session. So if you miss one or if you didn't, you came in late, you can go and look at these at any um, time. And then the third part of the uh, website is the community page. And So this is a wealth of information for your patients, for your clients, um, lay language. And so there's some text here. And then as we uh, scroll down, there are uh, links to PowerPoints, not narrated, but straight PowerPoints. And uh, on a variety of different kinds of cancer, you know, several on skin cancer, but breast cancer and lung cancer. and for the uh, teledermatology clinics, you should have received in the mail, the you know U.S. Postal Mail, an envelope that has, um, let's see, can we? Yeah, that has a bunch of these bookmarks, and the bookmarks have uh, the the education and QR codes. It's both sides, and so your your patients can just. Focus on a QR code and it will take you right to these presentations. And as I said, these, these presentations are for the lay public and um, a lot of information for, um, for, your, for your patients. And we also, in this um, uh, envelope that we sent you, we have a flyer, again, with all these QR codes and these topics, and you can hang these. Uh, you can make copies of them to give to your patients. You can hang these in all of your waiting rooms. 
or, uh, or in, and in the exam room. So while your patients are waiting for you, they can see this and they can start learning about uh, these various uh, topics. So is if any of our eight PCPs did not, our eight clinics did not receive these in the mail, uh, when did we send them? About three weeks ago? October. Yeah. Okay, the end of October. Um, please let us know and um, we'll send you more or whatever. Um, and we also, to the PCPs, we also included a couple of thank you bookmarks. Just wait a minute. I'm for uh, participating in the program. So if, um, uh, and then, oh, at the bottom of the community page is also a photo gallery of, of events that we've had. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we will, uh, I'll turn things back over to Dr. Patton um, and we'll begin the didactic. Thank you, Rhea. I didn't mean to jump the gun and, and uh, skip past that session. Uh, that's great information. And certainly the enhancements to the website have come about based on feedback from many of you who are participating. Um, we want to continue to be responsive to that as we go along. So now it's my privilege to reintroduce Dr. Kendall Buchanan, who will be our featured speaker again today. Um, she is with the Department of Dermatology at Augusta University and practices in the AU Center for Dermatology in Aiken, South Carolina. Today, she's going to update us on melanoma dermoscopic patterns. Uh, again, this will take about 20 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions. Again, if there are questions during her presentation, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, if not, we'll have a few minutes afterwards for uh, exchange with question and answers before we move to the next part of our dermatology session today. So with that, Dr. Buchanan, thank you again for joining us and for providing some education. All right, so I'm gonna shorten it a little bit um, just so that we have time for the um, session with the Moleskope training. But, you know, we're gonna try to cover as much as we can and hopefully we'll have time to do a few cases. So. Before we start, I just want everyone to recognize that we're just barely sort of touching the surface today. Um, we will talk about more things like acral lesions when we do pigmented lesions in skin of color in January. Um, but today, primarily, we're going to focus on melanoma structures and features. So We've talked about this before, um, general or global patterns. And so this requires the recognition of color, symmetry, and organization. And these are things that we do all the time. Now, the first couple of lectures I gave, we talked about the patterns of benign melanocytic nevi. So this is just a review of that. So typically for benign nevi, we can see different patterns. So we talked about the reticular network, patchy network, peripheral network and central hypopigmentation, peripheral network and central hyperpigmentation. We have a network and central globules, globular pattern, um, reticular pattern with peripheral globules and homogeneous patterns. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be asking ourselves the question, does the lesion deviate from one of these benign patterns? And if it does, it's more likely to be a malignant lesion. So this is an example of a reticular nevus in melanoma or a nevus with severe atypia. We would see something like a reticular pattern that's very disorganized. So you see these sort of lighter areas here where the network has faded. And then you can see some thickening of the network lines here in the periphery. So in this case, the, the network lines are a different thickness and the sizes of the holes can also vary. We talked about this particular nevus in our lighter skin type. So this is the per peripheral reticular network with central hypopigmentation. A malignant lesion would be more likely to have a reticular homogeneous disorganized pattern you can see where you have this sort of area of regression with this scar-like area, 
And then out in the periphery, you know it's melanocytic because you still see that network. However, given the other findings, this would be very atypical. Peripheral reticular network with central hyperpigmentation. This is a common nevus seen in a darker skin type. In a malignant lesion, you can see a reticular homogeneous disorganized pattern. And what you see here is what we call a blotch where you're unable to see structures underneath. And because it's located at the periphery, it's in an atypical location. It makes the whole lesion very asymmetric, and this would be concerning for a more malignant lesion. Homogeneous blue. I saw a patient today with a completely benign blue nevus on her scalp. Whenever you're more concerned about a malignant lesion, you can see more of a homogeneous disorganized pattern where you may see an area of blue that is asymmetric. Um, you could also perhaps see some shiny white structures um, if you are looking um, with polarized dermoscopy. Globular pattern, again, this is a beautiful benign nevus. The globules are located symmetrically throughout and they are relatively the same size and shape. In melanoma, you will see more of a globular disorganized pattern. You see globules of different sizes and shapes, which correspond to the melanocytic nest that you would see if this lesion were biopsied. Reticular globular, these are also a very common pattern that you can see in benign nevi. And then contrast that with a malignant lesion where you see a more reticular globular pattern that's disorganized. You see globules are located um, at the periphery in atypical location, different sizes and shapes. This is an example of an intradermal nevus. This commonly presents as a homogeneous globular pattern. You can also see those terminal hairs that are present as well. In melanoma, you're more likely to see a homogeneous globular disorganized pattern. As you can see on the far right, you see these very atypical globules. You also have some streaks located on the left side of the lesion, as well as the blue white veil. Two component pattern, these can be really hard. Um, this is an example of a nevus. You see a, the top half of the lesion is a globular pattern that's homogeneous, and the bottom half of the lesion is a reticular homogeneous pattern. In melanoma, you can also have, um, you know, more of a disorganized two component pattern. At the top, you have that, you know, sort of persistent globular pattern, and at the bottom, you have an atypical network um, with other atypical disorganized features. Multi-component pattern, these tend to have um, many different characteristics. You can see some perifollicular hyper or hypopigmentation, um, as well as, you know, diffuse globules with some ne peripheral network. And multi-component disorganized pattern is more likely to be seen in a melanoma. You can actually see here in the bottom left, you have a negative network, which we'll talk about today. So we reviewed the general or global patterns, and so now we'll move on to specific structures that we use to distinguish benign from malignant. So the first feature is an atypical network. And so here you have a benign lesion, which is a melanocytic nevus that has a typical pigment network. Again, you see regularly spaced lines with holes. The lines correspond to pigmentation along the reedy ridges, and then the holes are corresponding to the dermal papilla. In a malignant lesion, you're more likely to see an atypical network, which is seen here at the periphery. Focal streaks. So these can be seen in benign lesions. Typically, you can see this in pigmented spindle cell nevus of reed or a spitz nevus. The streaks tend to be symmetric in contrast to a melanoma. Um, you will often see streaks that are focal and located asymmetrically. Here's a few more examples here where you see focal streaks or what we also call focal radial streaming. Atypical dots and globules, we've touched on this a bit. Typically in benign nevi, you will see central dots. So 
They can be located centrally and also within the holes of the dermal papilla and also on the lines of the network. In melanoma, they are often um, distributed asymmetrically or focally located. And here you see an example of dots located on the network lines in contrast to dots that are located asymmetrically. And this is also a great example of a negative pigmented network. Globules, again, symmetrically distributed throughout this benign nevus. And then in a melanoma, they're you know, this overall has an extremely disorganized pattern, multiple features seen in melanoma with um, focal streaks, blue-white veil, as well as atypical dots and globules. Another example, um, this is a pattern usually seen in growing nevi. So you can usually see one, sometimes two tiers of globules located at the periphery. Um, However, in melanoma, multiple tiers of globules in an elderly patient or globules that are irregularly distributed should be um, biopsied to rule out melanoma. And this is an example here. Centrally located globules, globules that are red-brown in color are also concerning as these can sometimes be seen in malignant lesions such as a melanoma. Negative pigment network. We've touched on this before, but these are this is typically shown as irregularly shaped pigmented structures that are often elongated and have curvy linear globules. And they can be seen with both polarized and non-polarized dermoscopy, can be seen in a melanocytic nevus, as this example shows a congenital nevus. In melanoma, you can see these areas here. It's essentially the reverse of a regular pigment network where you see those globules and then the white lines serving as your network. Shiny white lines or crystalline structures, these are best seen with polarized dermoscopy. They can be seen um, in a Spitz nevus. They can also be seen in many other lesions such as a dermatofibroma. When in melanoma, they are often um, associated with an invasive melanoma because they correspond to altered collagen and fibroplasia. They are also typically orthogonally distributed um, and can be parallel as well. In contact, this is an example here that just shows the visibility of the shiny white structures that are more prominent with contact polarized dermoscopy which is what the molescope is. An off-center blotch. So again, we have this beautiful nevus on the left, and then on the right, you see this asymmetrically located blotch. You cannot see any structures underneath, and this is concerning for a melanoma. Gray dots granules. So these can be seen in benign lesions. Um, occasionally, you can see these in Nevi, you can also see these in lichen planus like keratosis. Whenever you see these in melanoma, they are usually asymmetrically located and make up greater than 10% of the lesion. And these are also found in the flat areas of the lesion. So we sometimes call this peppering. Usually fine peppering is seen with melanoma in situ or melanoma. Blue-white veil over raised areas. So again, this is a benign blue nevus. You see the blue-white veil is symmetrically distributed. On the right, we see a melanoma where the blue veil is not homogeneous. It's located asymmetrically. And these are best visualized with non-polarized dermoscopy. Usually if you use polarized dermoscopy on the blue-white veil, you will typically see the shiny white structures that correspond to the altered collagen and fibroplasia. And a few more examples here, the blue veil in an asymmetric location in this melanoma. Vascular structures, usually in benign nevi, such as this congenital nevus, you will see these comma-like vessels or slightly curved vessels that are typically diffuse and monomorphous. In malignant lesions, you can see different types of vessels. 
Um, so in melanoma, the most common pattern is polymorphous vessels, which consists of linear random vessels and vessels as dots. And lastly, peripheral tan brown structureless areas. So centrally, this is a tan brown structureless area. And then you see your peripheral reticular network at the periphery. This is seen in a benign nevus. And then in a malignant lesion, you will often see these tan areas that are at the periphery, usually making up greater than 10% of the lesion. And usually this is some type of regression or like scar-like area that you can see in melanomas. So I put this in here just to show that melanoma pathways are very complex. Um, and so we won't have time to talk about this today, but at some point we will talk about melanomas that can be seen specifically on sun damaged skin. Um, and in January, we will do a few cases of acral nevi and acral melanoma. Um, and these are things that we didn't get into today, um, but at some point we might go through these on a deeper level to kind of show you the different patterns that we see with you know, melanoma on sun damaged skin, which is very common. And then Rhea, I think I'll probably pause here and then we can um, go ahead and start doing our moleScope session, if that's okay with you. That, that sounds good. I think there's a lot of information there and then we can do the cases at another time. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Um, I look forward to lecturing again in January. Thank you, Dr. Buchanan. That was great. Um, I, I appreciated the side-by-side -side comparisons of things as you were going through that to help us understand what sometimes seems obvious, but what sometimes is often very subtle, but seeing them side-by-side -side was very helpful. So now we're going to move into um, this uh, second part where we're going to actually have some practical learning from users. Um, just like yourselves, and we're going to take advantage of Dr. Sam Whaling's generosity and his experience and help us uh, to kind of refresh ourselves on how best to use this and maybe even some tips and tricks in terms of how he's incorporated this into his practice. Um, we will have, in addition, some support from MedOptima, from Jody Rye, and from Aaron Hirsch. Uh, who uh, provide the mole scopes for us. Um, again, it's provided through the USDA grant. Um, and they may also have some tips to help us with workflow issues and also just practical advice on how to use that. So um, with that, um, Sam, are you ready to take over? I am here. I'm ready. That's great. Well, thanks for joining us again today and thanks for setting some time aside to share your experience with us. We look forward to hearing it. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Like uh, Dr. Doug Patton said, I'm, I'm Dr. Whaling. I'm in Lee Medical Arts in the Southwest Georgia um, area. Um, happy to be here and happy to um, help out and give you some of my um, experience with the Moleskope. Um, obviously there's uh, more experienced people on this call than I am. So if I say something or you want to chime in and tell me you know, or tell the tell the crowd here um, another tip or trick, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now um, so that we can jump right into um, Moleskope um, and uh, how to use the software from the Derm Engine side. So. Um, should be right there and then so and whoops can you still hear me yep yep great and we're gonna just start logging a patient here so um doug you are <laughs> the example today it might be better if it's doug nuts but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> we'll just do doug pat how about that that'd be great um 
So there's that. This. Okay. So I, I, I just enter in the amount of information that is needed. Um, you know, obviously you have your gender here. You're going to type in your date of birth, right? I don't know your date of birth, but, you know, Dr. Patton, you are a quite young looking lad there, born in 1980. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're going to look at your ethnicity. You're going to do your skin type. And um, Dr. Patton, I don't know if you want to comment on your um, skin, the Fitzpatrick um, scale, I believe. Yeah, I'm guessing it's in the one or two, probably the one. All right. Um, just continuing to scroll down. Um, I ask my patients, you know, while I'm in the room, um, you know, their uh, melanoma history. So I'm just going to kind of say no for each one of these patient history, the melanoma family history, the non-melanoma patient history. Um, I skip the address, city, postal code, you could put that in. And for purposes of later of having, you know, a um, patient registered inside the Dermap, this may help with your front staff and billing um, to, I guess, more quickly, um, you know, get this identification uh, to um, the, uh, I guess, Derm engine and to Augusta University in that respect, but I'm not going to uh, enter anything in. In my experience, I have not put anything in here. We've had um, other ways of identification, which um, Jody and Aaron will talk about. So um, I just want to focus on, you know, getting the picture um, in and the correct information so that we can get our pictures to the dermatologist um, so that they can help us out. So um, I'm hitting register patient in the bottom right. So as you can tell, that was a pretty quick process. There's not much to um, implement in order to register a patient, which is really good if you just go into a room meeting a patient for the first time and you can just go through that pretty quickly and enter some information in. So now that we've entered the patient information in, um, now it's time to enter you know, the um, lesion. So in the bottom left-hand corner, um, next to the trash can, um, there's a um, figure with a heart. And I'm just going to click on that. And that's automatically going to bring up um, this figure of the person. So um, what I've learned in my experience is if you want to look for um, a lesion on the head, you're going to click that head and the bot, like the, that's green shaded in the left-hand side of your screen or a foot or a hand. And that just helps you focus in. You can do, you know, the um, finger where you kind of make, things bigger with your um, hand, that action on your screen to help. But if I click on the head, um, it will automatically push me to the head and it makes it pretty easy. So uh, we're going to have a lesion right here. So I just click on the screen in that exact um, spot on that uh, skull. And um, now it's blinking and we have a um, lesion added. So after you add that lesion, you know, you go one at a time. So if there were multiple lesions, um, you would be worried about the second lesion later. So uh, you just enter in one location at a time. And next we'll go up to the top right um, hand corner of the screen where it hits next. So just hitting next. So now we are ready to take the picture. Um, we are first gonna do the over, you have obviously two, two images that you wanna take an overview image and then a uh, dermoscopic image. So you can kind of see those on your screen. So I always do the overview image first. Um, so I will do that. Um, so I, you have my one, my shared screen, but um, I think you guys can see me um, in my office as well. So if you wouldn't mind, look at me in my office. Um, you know, we have our scope here that ends up attaching to our phone. I apologize about my shared screen, but right, we have this um, device that 
basically has a sticky um, plastic connection that goes on the phone. Um, it will come on and off, um, but there is a hole at the top of it. That's where you want the camera to be um, veering through. So you have um, want to line that up on your phone. I can come on and off your phone pretty easily, but right with the overview image, we're going to keep the scope off first. So I'm going to leave this uh, scope off and I'm going to just take an overview image of my arm. It's not very good, but I'm not looking for um, any, I guess, good um, picture here. And obviously this is not my head or Doug's head. So there's that button in the um, top left corner that's white and you just want to click that with your phone so i just took a picture of my um, arm and that lesion that i have there uh, or lack of better words the um, mole that i have there so um, notice that the when i took a picture that you have um, the initial picture and then it goes to a cropped image and you can crop that image to go in and out as big as you want. Um, what I found is that my top image or my first image with before the cropped image, it will sometimes seem a bit blurry, but then whenever you move your crop image and you crop it, 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 it seems to crisp up the definition. So once you get the cropped image, you just check, hit the check mark in the bottom right hand corner and um, brings you back to your page where you have the overview image and the dermoscopic image. So um, we have our overview image. Now we're gonna go for our dermoscopic image. And um, to do that, I want you to draw attention again to the screen where, um, not my shared screen, but my face. And I wanna show that, you know, this microscope is magnetized um, to the plastic piece here. So, right, um, you would just slide it on and you'd feel it just pull right in. But first, um, before you attach, I just want to, uh, and I do this every time, um, in the kit, you are given a cleaning um, cloth. Um, so you always want to make sure that you clean your camera lens on your phone first and then go for the lens on the front of the scope. And then obviously there's a lens on the back of the scope. So uh, make sure you clean all lens just every time, just make it routine. There is a light, the light that you have on the scope is at the very front, it's a button. So you just push that right there and you can kind of see the light come on. Um, and then you would attach just like that, okay? So going back to my shared screen, um, bottom right hand corner, you click that green plus um, image and that will pull up. So now you have the scope. Um, as you can see, um, there is a measurement in millimeters that is attached to the scope, which is quite handy um, to help you know what you're looking at, but also for the dermatologist to look at afterwards. So. Um, you know, you're just going to line that up to your skin, but, and I'm talking as the same, same time that I line this up to my skin and I kind of put it flush up to my skin and let it rest. Um, but you want to use a alcohol swab to, you know, wipe the, uh, area of concern off before actually taking the picture, right? Cause we're trying to get all the dead skin cells off. And whatever debris might be in the way of best taking picture of that that lesion. So once you have it lined up, and like I've got hair in the way, you know, if you think that you need to shave some hair off to help, you know, improve the picture, please do. Um, but I'm just gonna, you know, touch that button, which is the snap portion or trigger, to take the picture in the top left hand corner. Um, so that white button, and then it took the capture the picture. And then um, should go back to my, there we go, it was a little bit delayed. So there we go. And so now I have captured both the overview image and the dermoscopic image. 
So those are both in the patient's registered profile. And then I could still be in the room or I could have stepped out of the patient's room and I'm going to now look at sending this image to the dermatologist. So how do we do this? There's that DX in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. You're gonna go ahead and click that. It brings up the dermoscopic image and um, underneath that you see the visit type. You're going to click the teleconsult is what I end up doing. Um, I, at this point, hold off on doing the primary diagnosis. Um, to be honest, I don't know if uh, that, when I put that in, if that shows up for the dermatologist or not, but I, I kind of hold off on that. I go straight to the referral under the actions. And so um, I, I do that and it uh, listed providers. And I don't know if my phone's just slow or I don't use this phone. Remember, this is my personal phone. So, um, you know, if I were to type in Dr. Buchanan here, I don't know. I thought this would be connecting in. Let me see. Because it usually populates a, a bunch of um, available providers. And it's not doing that. B-U-C-H. I'm sorry? B-U-C-H. Oh, maybe that's it. I apologize, Dr. Buchanan. No, okay, all right. Well, the function's not great. So usually, and I, maybe I'll just go through this algorithm here, but usually I will type in provider and she will come up and I will just click her um, because that's the provider that I want it to go to. Um, and so I'm just gonna follow this algorithm. So basically I, I clicked Augusta University. I, I don't know if that just goes to it overall drop box, but I would be looking to, um, you know, Dr. Buchanan or whoever else, maybe I guess the university told you to um, submit your, your, um, your pictures to. Um, from here, and this is the, the um, unfortunate part because whenever you do click Dr. Buchanan at this point, it, it does bring you to another page where you would be entering um, a little bit of an HPI um, about the patient. Um, and I don't, I think it, it's lost because it didn't bring her up. So I apologize, but at that, so I would click on Dr. Buchanan and it would then bring up uh, like probably 10 questions about the patient, again, about the lesion. So it's gonna ask you if it's been there for um, less or greater than three months. Um, and it will ask you again about family history and it will um, ask a few other questions. It will also ask you of your best interpretation of the lesion and what you think it is, which I think is a great exercise for us in the community. And then um, it will ask you to, I believe, to submit at that point. But I am going to say submit diagnosis here, and that's in the bottom right hand corner. So, yeah, I apologize. This is that that part's not working either. But I think from this from this point, and I, I hope this was enough. Um, you know, it it kind of gives you a refresher on how to at least get the picture of the, the patient's lesion in the room, um, set up the teleconsult, um, choose the provider that you want to submit to. And then, like I said, you go through the, um, the questionnaire and then um, you end up submitting. And then I'm just gonna talk this out. Once you end up submitting, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, once once you end up submitting the uh, picture, then uh, please, and, and this is what's been asked of me, um, because I know that time sum is of the essence, and I know that um, 
I guess, you know, our university wants to get to you um, as soon as possible and even possibly get back to the patient on what the diagnosis would be before the patient left the clinic. Um, but uh, so if you submit the diagnosis, you text your provider, they may be able to get to you in time with an answer um, before your, your patient leaves. If not, um, that's hard, a little bit hard for me to do. I just submit. Um, I tell my patient I'll get that picture back to them, you know, within a week, which is more than an ample time for Dr. Buchanan to review the image and get back with me. Um, and then I can get back with the patient. But I do want to, I guess, like open up the floor for any questions at this point or any other providers who have any input on, you know, how to use the scope. Thanks, Dr. Wiling, for sharing that. Uh, we recognize it's a little bit artificial trying to do this for an audience as opposed to just doing it in the clinic uh, as part of the workflow. Any questions or comments from anyone? Jody, Aaron, have something to share? Yeah, so uh, real quick, Dr. Wiley, I'm not sure why you weren't able to see the clinics. Uh, we'll look into that because it should be part of your login there. I don't know if it's your connection speed or something else, but we'll look, look into that piece of it. Um, but yeah, um, I know that Jody has spent some time working on some slides to share about the workflow and some of the billing questions on kind of how to share that information. Uh, but really quickly, wanted just to make sure to see if anybody else had, had any questions about the actual process or the workflow that Dr. Whaley had just went through. I like to. Add one comment that um, when Dr. Whaling mentioned about turning on the light, uh, you have to make sure that your Moscope is charged. So, um, uh, which, I mean, I don't regularly use it, but this morning I wanted to practice and I realized, oh, I needed to plug it in. And um, in your kit, there's a, you know, a charger thing and it, it goes in there. So you just want to make sure that you always keep it fully charged. And it's very simple, as you said, there's a little thing there at the bottom, it just goes into a micro SD uh, cord and, and charges that way. And then there is going to be a light indicator that's going to turn green when it is fully charged as well on the on the little button. There, so Perfect. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Willing, for that. I uh, just have a couple of things to add. I won't take too long. I know we're almost at the end, uh, end of the session here, so I'm going to share my um, Green. If Ria Beth, you could just enable uh, screen sharing. I have a couple of slides here that I can share. Um, uh, some of the things that we've actually discussed is going to be how can you take these images, register the patient, take these images, and send the referral quickly in a clinical setting. And Dr. Willing has kind of described what you can do prior to even seeing the patient or as the patient is there and uh, what a procedure would look like, what a clinical workflow would look like. Ideally, um, while you're with the patient, it actually will only take a matter of a couple of minutes I have an overview chart right over here that will show you what a case submission will look like. We've discussed uh, opening the Derm Engine app. That's the very first step. You log into Derm Engine. You can either create a patient, which Dr. Willing uh, showed us today, or you can select an existing patient if they've been there already or they were created earlier in the day. And then you have about three different steps. So adding a spot, adding your images, and then selecting the diagnosis and referral and selecting your provider, in this case, Dr. Buchanan. Uh, you fill out the questionnaire at the end and submit the case. So uh, from start to finish, this could take you anywhere from one minute to about three minutes with the patient. As you're asking them the questions, you're staying engaged and you're capturing the high quality image. One thing that we are also going to be working with your teams is the administration portion of it to reduce that caseload from you and that workload. So we are going to actually be utilizing the uh, what your clinic's EMRs are currently providing for patient information sheet instead of having to handwrite PDFs. Over the course of the next few weeks, we'll be communicating and sharing this information directly with you and your team and we can uh, gather the administration contact, uh, front desk reception, so we can kind of help you aid in uh, completing this workflow. And that way, 
we're taking care of the rest, we're well take care of the training for the administration portion, and you can focus on your patients, uh, providing the best patient care possible, uh, really focusing on using those dermatoscopes and sending them to Dr. Buchanan uh, to get the best, uh, to, to, to get your teleconsultation results. Um, so it would be as simple as they would have to open up Dermengine web on the computer, log into Dermengine, select the existing patient, it will be at the top of the list for them, and they can upload the PDF face sheet uh, directly from the EMR. So like I mentioned, we'll be uh, working with the teams over the next, uh, next few weeks on implementing this. And hopefully this will uh, alleviate any challenges that you may face, any apprehensions that you may face in using the Moleskope and really be able to use DermEngine in utilizing uh, this asset that you have available at your, at your fingertips. Uh, a few other things that Dr. Whaling had mentioned uh, really well is how to capture those high quality images. And high quality images is going to be the number one most important thing when we're looking at teledermatology because the dermatologist is going to be uh, using not only the patient demographic, demographic demographic data, but uh, the questions uh, and answers, but primarily looking at these images and trying to determine uh, the, the diagnosis based on the image itself without having to see the patient there. So uh, having an identifiable amount of the body part for your overview image on the left-hand side is, is very helpful. And focusing your camera and tapping the screen to hold the device steady to get capture a really clear, crisp image of the dermoscopic image is very, very important. We can see that having it in line, um, in centered is great. And then having a blurry image like we see on the left-hand side is, um, won't be, won't be um, readable when you're sending through its case. So it's very important to make sure you're capturing that image. And then finally here, we have some uh, examples in common errors. So we can see a high quality image at the top here is what we're looking for. Uh, you're making sure the light is turned on and it's complete contact with the skin. Uh, we are trying to avoid unfocused or blurry images. One of the tips over here is you can tap the screen to focus on iPhones especially. Non-centered image, when it's off too much, you may be um, missing some part of the lesion. So try to center it to the best of your capabilities. And then the third one is one we see actually quite often is there's no direct contact contact of the Moleskope's glass plate with the skin surface. So you do want to make sure that you have direct contact, not too much pressure, or you're going to be um, causing any sort of distortion, but you want to make sure you do have direct pressure. And then uh, lastly, as Dr. Whaling had mentioned, do use an immersion fluid. So even a drop of alcohol, alcohol swab is great as well. And that's going to really help get your uh, clear, crisp image. And that's it for me. Yes, Jody, that's great. Thanks for the additional help. Um, and we all know that uh, practice makes perfect. So this is a, a good refresher for us. And hopefully this will encourage folks who might have been a little bit reluctant to just get the devices out and play with them a little bit and uh, learn how to do it. So um, I will say that there was a question in the chat that I want to address. It goes back uh, to... Obumene Okoro wanting to know about uh, darkly pigmented skin and can one easily distinguish the reticular pattern and the honeycomb pattern in darkly pigmented skin. As Dr. Buchanan mentioned, we're going to have a special session in January uh, devoted exclusively to uh, the notion of using these devices and helping to come up with um, uh, assistance for patients with dark uh, dark pigment in skin. So I'm going to press pause on that answer for that one, but just know that we're going to address that coming up. So let's see if there's anything else in the chat. Um, I don't see anything right now. Getting close to time. Um, again, just express my appreciation to everybody. Uh, Aaron, uh, Jody, uh, Dr. Whaling, uh, Dr. Buchanan for a great presentation. Yes. There's yeah. a question. There is a hand hand raised. Uh, hand raised. Okay. Uh, Soren Estival. Yeah, yes. family medicine. Is there any chance we can get one of those scopes for our clinic, so that we can do be more involved with like derm diagnosis? So, Which clinic are you? Family medicine clinic at AU. 
Oh, okay. I think there's an answer in there also that y'all are getting a couple of uh, different types of devices, but you'll soon be engaged. We got our dermatoscopes today, so we have those, but we don't actually have an expert to tell us what we're looking at. Okay. I think what what we're dealing with in that case um, is the same situation where you can arrange for the consultation, uh, but maybe since there's a concentration of you at the at the uh, AU Family Medicine Clinic, maybe we can arrange for some uh, special drop-in sessions for y'all. Cool. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks for your engagement. Um, I also want to add that um, we put we did put in the chat for our um, the telederm clinics uh, to make sure you give us your the administrators contact information so Jody can um, can contact them and and go through this workflow um, the the paperwork uh, face page chart. Um, one last comment on the response about who can get the the uh, the moleskopes um, is we we are the USDA grant is to support rural um, equipment provision. The education part of this is open to anyone, but as far as being able to buy scopes for you, we can't do that unless you qualify for the rural scopes. That said, we want everyone to continue to participate, and we'll do whatever we can to help make this meaningful for everyone who can. So with that, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it back over to you, Rhea, and let you close us out. So thank you. Um, thanks, Doug. Um, so of, of course, and um, think about um, joining, you know, buying your own Moscope and your own subscription to Derm Engine uh, to go along this route. Uh, these rural clinics are funded by by this grant, and um, uh, so they get they get the moleskopes and the dimension um, from being paid for by the grant. Uh, so, um, and certainly we are willing to do more of this hands-on refresher things if um, if our clinics want uh, want them. So please please let us know. Um, I hope it was uh, useful. Uh, let's see. So thank you all for participating. Uh, there should be in the chat the information about CME or um, uh, I guess, Brenda, can do you want to put up the last slide with the CME information on it? And um, our next session will be the second Monday of January because the first Monday is uh, New Year's and I don't expect any of us will be um, in our offices or clinics, whatever, on New Year's Day. So we will have our next tele-echo session on January 9th. Uh, Dr. Buchanan will speak about pigmented lesions in skin of color. Uh, Renee Copeland, a fourth year medical student, will do a case presentation. And we need a case presentation from our uh, one of our clinic providers. So anybody who would um, uh, like to volunteer to present a case, please let us know. As you know, you can always contact us at teledermatology at augusta.edu. And um, I think that about wraps it up for today. And uh, thank you all for attending. I hope it was useful. I'll remind you to anyone, go on to our teledermatology website. We put a lot of effort um, into um, having good information in, um, on, on that website. Feel free to consult it at any time. And I would ask um, our teledermatology team members to uh, stay on for a couple of minutes and the rest of you uh, can log, um, log off, sign off, and um, hope you have a good rest of the day and happy holidays to everyone, uh, whatever way you celebrate the winter holidays. We hope that they are happy and you get time uh, to be with family and friends and that everybody stays well. And we'll see you in 2023. Thank you guys. And Thanks Ray, if everyone. anything we can do for you guys, let us know, happy to do additional trainings or recordings for you guys. So thank you guys for this opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. All right.